Part 1 of Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners by John Bunyan Part 1 Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, or a brief relation of the exceeding mercy of God in Christ to his poor servant, john bunyan in this my relation of the merciful working of god upon my soul it will not be amiss if in the first place i do in a few words give you a hint of my pedigree and manner of upbringing that thereby the goodness and bounty of god towards me may be the more advanced and magnified before the sons of men for my descent then it was as is well known by many of a low and inconsiderable generation my father's house being of that rank that is meanest and most despised of all the families in the land. Wherefore I have not here, as others, to boast of noble blood, or of a high-born state, according to the flesh, though, all things considered, I magnify the heavenly majesty, for that by this door he brought me into this world, to partake of the grace and life that is in Christ by the gospel. But yet, notwithstanding the meanness and inconsiderableness of my parents, it pleased God to put it into their hearts to put me to school, to learn both to read and write, the which I also attained according to the rate of other poor men's children, though, to my shame, I confess, I did soon lose that little I learned, and that even almost utterly, and that long before the Lord did work his gracious work of conversion upon my soul. As for my own natural life, for the time that I was without God in the world, it was indeed according to the course of this world, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 2 and 3. It was my delight to be taken captive by the devil at his will. 2 Timothy 2, 26. Being filled with all unrighteousness, the which did also so strongly work and put forth itself, both in my heart and life, and that from a child, that I had but few equals, especially considering my years, which were tender, being few, both for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. Yea, so settled and rooted was I in these things, that they became as a second nature to me, the which, as I also have with soberness considered since, did so offend the Lord, that even in my childhood he did scare and affright me with fearful dreams, and did terrify me with dreadful visions. For often, after I had spent this and the other day in sin, I have in my bed been greatly afflicted while asleep, with the apprehensions of devils and wicked spirits, who still, as I then thought, labored to draw me away with them, of which I could never be rid. Also I should, at these years, be greatly afflicted and troubled with the thoughts of the day of judgment, and that both night and day, and should tremble at the thoughts of the fearful torments of hell fire still fearing that it would be my lot to be found at last amongst those devils and hellish fiends who are there bound down with the chains and bonds of eternal darkness unto the judgment of the great day. These things, I say, when I was but a child but nine or ten years old, did so distress my soul, that when in the midst of my many sports and childish vanities, amidst my vain companions, I was often much cast down and afflicted in my mind therewith, yet could I not let go my sins. Yea, I was also then so overcome with despair of life and heaven, that I should often wish either that there had been no hell, or that I had been a devil, supposing they were only tormentors, that if it must needs be that I went thither, I might be rather a tormentor than be tormented myself. A while after, these terrible dreams did leave me, which also I soon forgot, for my pleasures did quickly cut off the remembrance of them as if they had never been, Wherefore, with more greediness, according to the strength of nature, I did still let loose the reins to my lust, and delighted in all transgression against the law of God, so that, until I came to the state of marriage, I was the very ringleader of all the youth that kept me company, into all manner of vice and ungodliness. Yea, such prevalency had the lusts and fruits of the flesh in this poor soul of mine, that had not a miracle of precious grace prevented, I had not only perished by the stroke of eternal justice, but had also laid myself open even to the stroke of those laws which bring some to disgrace and open shame before the face of the world. In these days the thoughts of religion were very grievous to me. I could neither endure it myself, nor that any other should so that, when I have seen some read in those books that concern Christian piety, it would be as it were a prison to me. Then I said unto God, 
Depart from me, for I desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Job 21.14 I was now void of all good consideration. Heaven and hell were both out of sight and mind, and as for saving and damning, they were least in my thoughts. O Lord, thou knowest my life, and my ways were not hid from thee. Yet this I well remember, that though I could myself sin with the greatest delight and ease, and also take pleasure in the vileness of my companions, yet even then, if I have at any time seen wicked things by those who professed goodness, it would make my spirit tremble. As once, above all the rest, when I was in my height of vanity, yet hearing one to swear that was reckoned for a religious man, it had so great a stroke upon my spirit that it made my heart to ache. But God did not utterly leave me, but followed me still, not now with convictions, but judgments, yet such as were mixed with mercy. For once I fell into a creek of the sea, and hardly escaped drowning. Another time I fell out of a boat into Bedford River, but mercy yet preserved me alive. Besides, another time, being in the field with one of my companions, it chanced that an adder passed over the highway, so I, having a stick in my hand, struck her over the back, and, having stunned her, I forced open her mouth with my stick, and plugged her sting out with my fingers, by which act, had not God been merciful, I might, by my desperateness, have brought myself to mine end. This also have I taken notice of with thanksgiving, when I was a soldier, I, with others, were drawn out to go to such a place to besiege it. But when I was just ready to go, one of the company desired to go in my room, to which, when I had consented, he took my place, and coming to the siege, as he stood sentinel, he was shot into the head with a musket bullet, and died. Here, as I said, were judgments and mercy, but neither of them did awaken my soul to righteousness. Wherefore I sinned still, and grew more and more rebellious against God, and careless of mine own salvation. Presently after this I changed my condition into a married state, and my mercy was to light upon a wife whose father was counted godly. This woman and I, though we came together as poor as poor might be, not having so much household stuff as a dish or spoon betwixt us both, yet this she had for her part, the plain man's pathway to heaven, and the practice of piety, which her father had left her when he died. In these two books I should sometimes read with her, wherein I also found some things that were somewhat pleasing to me, but all this while I met with no conviction. She also would be often telling of me what a godly man her father was, and how he would reprove and correct vice, both in his house and amongst his neighbors, what a strict and holy life he lived in his day, both in word and deed. Wherefore these books with this relation, though they did not reach my heart to awaken it about my sad and sinful state, yet they did beget within me some desires to religion, so that, because I knew no better, I fell in very eagerly with the religion of the times, to wit, to go to church twice a day, and that too with the foremost, and there should very devoutly both say and sing as others did, yet retaining my wicked life. But withal I was so overrun with a spirit of superstition, that I adored, and that with great devotion, even all things, both the high place, priest, clerk, vestment, service, and what else belonging to the church, counting all things holy that were therein contained, and especially the priest and clerk most happy, and without doubt greatly blessed because they were the servants, as I then thought, of God and were principal in the holy temple, to do his work therein. This conceit grew so strong in little time upon my spirit, that had I but seen a priest, though never so sordid and debauched in his life, I should find my spirit fall under him, reverence him, and knit unto him. Yea, I thought for the love I did bear unto them, supposing they were the ministers of God, I could have lain down at their feet and have been trampled upon by them. Their name, their garb, and work did so intoxicate and bewitch me. After I had been thus for some considerable time, another thought came into my mind, and that was, whether we were of the Israelites or no. For finding in the scriptures that they were once the peculiar people of God, thought I, if I were one of this race, my soul must needs be happy. Now again I found within me a great longing to be resolved about this question, but could not tell how I should. At last I asked my father of it, who told me, no, we were not. Wherefore then I fell in my spirit as to the hopes of that, and so remained. But all this while I was not sensible of the danger and evil of sin. I was kept from considering that sin would damn me what religion soever I followed unless I was found in Christ. 
nay i never thought of him nor whether there was one or no thus man while blind doth wander but wearieth himself with vanity for he knoweth not the way to the city of god ecclesiastes ten fifteen but one day amongst all the sermons our parson made his subject was to treat of the sabbath day and of the evil of breaking that either with labour sports or otherwise now i was notwithstanding my religion one that took much delight in all manner of vice and especially that was the day that i did solace myself therewith wherefore i fell in my conscience under his sermon thinking and believing that he made that sermon on purpose to show me my evil doing and at that time i felt what guilt was though never before that i can remember but then i was for the present greatly loaden therewith and so went home when the sermon was ended with a great burden upon my spirit this for that instant did benumb the sinews of my best delights and did embitter my former pleasures to me but behold it lasted not for before i had well dined the trouble began to go off my mind and my heart returned to his old course but oh how glad was i that this trouble was gone from me and that the fire was put out that i might sin again without control wherefore when i had satisfied nature with my food i shook the sermon out of my mind and to my old custom of sports and gaming i returned with great delight but the same day as i was in the midst of a game at cat and having struck it one blow from the hole just as i was about to strike it the second time a voice did suddenly dart from heaven into my soul which said wilt thou leave thy sins and go to heaven or have thy sins and go to hell at this i was put to an exceeding maze wherefore leaving my cat upon the ground i looked up to heaven and was as if i had with the eyes of my understanding seen the lord jesus looking down upon me as being very hotly displeased with me and as if he did severely threaten me with some grievous punishment for those and other my ungodly practices i had no sooner thus conceived in my mind but suddenly this conclusion was fastened upon my spirit for the former hint did set my sins again before my face that i had been a great and grievous sinner and that it was now too late for me to look after heaven for christ would not forgive me nor pardon my transgressions then i fell to musing upon this also and while i was thinking on it and fearing lest it should be so i felt my heart sink in despair concluding it was too late and therefore i resolved in my mind i would go on in sin for thought i if the case be thus my state is surely miserable miserable if i leave my sins and but miserable if i follow them i can but be damned and if i must be so i had as good be damned for many sins as to be damned for few thus i stood in the midst of my play before all that then were present but yet i told them nothing but i say i having made this conclusion i returned desperately to my sport again and i well remember that presently this kind of despair did so possess my soul that i was persuaded i could never attain to other comfort than what i should get in sin for heaven was gone already so that on that i must not think wherefore i found within me a great desire to take my fill of sin still studying what sin was set to be committed that i might taste the sweetness of it and i made as much haste as i could to fill my belly with its delicates lest i should die before i had my desire for that i feared greatly in these things i protest before god i lie not neither do i feign this sort of speech these were really strongly and with all my heart my desires the good lord whose mercy is unsearchable forgive me my transgressions and i am very confident that this temptation of the devil is more than usual amongst poor creatures than many are aware of even to overrun their spirits with a scurvy and seared frame of heart and benumbing of conscience which frame he stilly and slyly supplieth with such despair that though not much guilt attendeth his soul yet they continually have a secret conclusion within them that there is no hope for them for they have loved sins therefore after them they will go jeremiah two twenty five and eighteen verse twelve now therefore i went on in sin with great greediness of mind still grudging that i could not be so satisfied with it as i would this did continue with me about a month or more but one day as i was standing at a neighbor's shop window and there cursing and swearing and playing the madman after my wonted manner there sat within the woman of the house and heard me who though she was a very loose and ungodly wretch 
yet protested that I swore and cursed at that most fearful rate that she was made to tremble to hear me, and told me further that I was the ungodliest fellow for swearing that ever she heard in all her life, and that I, by thus doing, was able to spoil all the youth in a whole town, if they came but in my company. At this reproof I was silenced, and put to secret shame, and that too, as I thought, before the God of heaven. Wherefore, while I stood there, and hanging down my head, I wished with all my heart that I might be a little child again, that my father might learn to speak without this wicked way of swearing. For, thought I, I am so accustomed to it, that it is in vain for me to think of a reformation, for I thought it could never be. But, how it came to pass, I know not, I did from this time forward so leave my swearing, that it was a great wonder to myself to observe it. And whereas before I knew not how to speak, unless I put an oath before and another behind, to make my words have authority, now I could, without it, speak better, and with more pleasantness than ever I could before. All this, while I knew not Jesus Christ, neither did I leave my sports and plays. But quickly after this I fell in company with one poor man that made profession of religion, who, as I then thought, did talk pleasantly of the scriptures, and of the matters of religion. Wherefore, falling into some love and liking to what he said, I betook me to my Bible, and began to take great pleasure in reading, but especially with the historical part thereof. For, as for Paul's epistles and scriptures of that nature, I could not away with them, being as yet but ignorant, either of the corruptions of my nature, or of the want and worth of Jesus Christ to save me. Wherefore I fell to some outward reformation, both in my words and life, and did set the commandments before me for my way to heaven, which commandments I also did strive to keep, and, as I thought, did keep them pretty well sometimes, and then I should have comfort. Yet now and then should break one, and so afflict my conscience. But then I should repent, and say I was sorry for it, and promise God to do better next time, and there get help again, for then I thought I pleased God as well as any man in England. Thus I continued about a year, all which time our neighbors did take me to be a very godly man, a new and religious man, and did marvel much to see such a great and famous alteration in my life and manners. And, indeed, so it was, though yet I knew not Christ, nor grace, nor faith, nor hope, and truly, as I have well seen since, had I then died, my state had been most fearful. Well, this, I say, continued about a twelve-month or more." But, I say, my neighbors were amazed at this my great conversion, from prodigious profaneness to something like a moral life. And truly, so they well might, for this my conversion was as great as for Tom of Bedlam to become a sober man. Now, therefore, they began to praise, to commend, and to speak well of me, both to my face and behind my back. Now I was, as they said, become godly. Now I was become a right honest man." But, oh, when I understood that these were their words and opinions of me, it pleased me mighty well. For though, as yet, I was nothing but a poor painted hypocrite, yet I loved to be talked of as one that was truly godly. I was proud of my godliness, and I did all I did, either to be seen of or to be well spoken of by man. And thus I continued for about a twelve-month or more. Now you must know that before this I had taken much delight in ringing, but my conscience beginning to be tender, I thought such practice was but vain, and therefore forced myself to leave it. Yet my mind hankered, wherefore I should go to the steeple-house and look on it, though I durst not ring. But I thought this did not become religion neither, yet I forced myself and would look on still. But quickly after I began to think, how if one of the bells should fall? Then I chose to stand under a main beam that lay over thwart the steeple from side to side, thinking there I might stand sure, but then I should think again, should the bell fall with a swing, it might first hit the wall, and then rebound it upon me, might kill me for all this beam. This made me stand in the steeple door, and now, thought I, I am safe enough, for if a bell should then fall, I can slip out behind these thick walls, and so be preserved notwithstanding. So after this I would yet go to see them ring, but would not go farther than the steeple door. But then it came into my head, how if the steeple itself should fall? And this thought, it may fall for aught I know, when I stood and looked on, did continually so shake my mind, that I durst not stand at the steeple door any longer, but was forced to flee, for fear the steeple should fall upon my head. Another thing was my dancing. I was a full year before I could quite leave that, 
but all this while when i thought i kept this or that commandment or did by word or deed anything that i thought was good i had great peace in my conscience and should think with myself god cannot choose but be now pleased with me yea to relate it in mine own way i thought no man in england could please god better than i but poor wretch as i was i was all this while ignorant of jesus christ and going about to establish my own righteousness and had perished therein had not god in mercy showed me more of my state of nature but upon a day the good providence of god did cast me to bedford to work on my calling and in one of the streets of that town i came where there were three or four poor women sitting at a door in the sun and talking about the things of god and being now willing to hear them discourse i drew near to hear what they said for i was now a brisk talker also myself in the matters of religion but now i may say i heard but i understood not for they were far above out of my reach for their talk was about a new birth the work of god on their hearts also how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature they talked how god had visited their souls with his love in the lord jesus and with what words and promises they had been refreshed comforted and supported against the temptations of the devil moreover they reasoned of the suggestions and temptations of satan in particular and told to each other by which they had been afflicted and how they were borne up under his assaults they also discoursed of their own wretchedness of heart of their unbelief and did contemn slight and abhor their own righteousness as filthy and insufficient to do them any good and methought they spake as if joy did make them speak they spake with such pleasantness of scripture language and with such appearance of grace in all they said that they were to me as if they had found a new world as if they were people that dwelt alone and were not to be reckoned among their neighbours numbers twenty three nine at this i felt my own heart begin to shake as mistrusting my condition to be naught for i saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation the new birth did never enter into my mind neither knew i the comfort of the word and promise nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart as for secret thoughts i took no notice of them neither did i understand what satan's temptations were nor how they were to be withstood and resisted etc thus therefore when i had heard and considered what they said i left them and went about my employment again but their talk and discourse went with me also my heart would tarry with them for i was greatly affected with their words both because by them i was convinced that i wanted the true tokens of a truly godly man and also because by them i was convinced of the happy and blessed condition of him that was such a one End of part one.